Okay, good day everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jules Keith Lay with the Center for Teaching and Learning. We are very happy to um, offer this workshop today in partnership with Atkins Library. The workshop today is Open Access Publishing, Licensing and Funding, and we are joined by two of our colleagues from Atkins Library who are experts in this area to talk to us about this subject. Kate Dixon, our Copyright and Licensing Librarian, and Liz Seiler, our Interim Associate Dean for Collections services. Thank you for presenting this workshop for us today. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, as uh, the title of this webinar says, we're going to be talking about open access publishing, specifically the licensing and funding related to open access publishing. Um, just really quick, uh, I am, I'm Liz Seiler. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for Collection Services. Um, I manage the collection services unit in the library and I also um, manage the collections budget and negotiations with vendors um, among other responsibilities and then Kate if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi everybody I'm Kate Dixon I'm the copyright and licensing librarian at Atkins and so I work with um, faculty staff and students on copyright issues associated with their teaching and research and I also work with Liz on um, negotiations with vendors too. So. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing um, I wanted to um, just start out with is, you know, defining open access or how we define open access um, sorry, in the library. So open access publishing of scholarly work guarantees research is available online at no cost for the reader and increases the dis dissemination of ideas to improve our global society. Unlocking unnecessary paywalls to influential research is not, o not only increases the impact of research conducted at UNC Charlotte, but supports information equity for people around the world. Um, this is something that the library has been um, advocating for and supporting for some time now, but we are continuing to uh, increase the um, outreach to our campus to encourage faculty and students and staff to consider publishing their scholarly work uh, openly. Um, and there are uh, there are three here, but there are probably many more reasons to publish open access. Um, uh, democratizing information by removing barriers to access. So um, the research that's being done on our campus can be accessed and um, uh, used uh, throughout the world. Um, it accelerates discovery. So um, if your article is open, that means more people can read it and cite it and use it and it's, it's better for everyone. And it encourages innovation because the more people that can um, access research, the more they can um, uh, practice their own research, um, and that increases innovation overall. So, just really quickly, there are there are several different kinds of open access, but the two main are green and gold. So, green open access is when you um, put scholarly work in a um, institutional repository, which on our campus, we have a Niner Commons that is hosted in the library, um, where you can put preprint articles or postprint, depending on what your um, uh, contract says, and that's something that Kate will talk about. Um, you can also put any scholarly work that you would, you would want into the institutional repository, including uh, poster sessions or um, presentation slides or um, uh, educational materials that you cr you've created and wanna make open. So there are a lot of options um, in green open access. And there are also, there is green open access outside of a, a ac academic institutional repository. There's um, things like PubMed and, and such where you would uh, um, put it in a uh, organization's institutional repository. Um, and then there's gold open access, which um, basically is uh, any article that is published in a journal or um, in some sort of, um, container outside of a repository. Um, and uh, uh, that could also be like an open book or something like that as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Kate so she can talk about author rights. Okay, so um, thank you Liz. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about author rights. Um, so what are author rights? Um, so when you decide to publish an article in a journal you own the full copyright in that article. Um, so a traditional subscription type journal is going to require you to sign an agreement transferring some or all of those rights to the publisher. So, but as the author of a work, you are the copyright holder unless and until 
you decide to transfer the copyright to someone else in a signed agreement. So you get to decide which rights you want to keep and which ones you want to give away. Um, so if you transfer a copyright without retaining any rights, generally you're going to have to ask permission from that publisher in order to place the work on your course website or copy it for students or your colleagues or deposit that work in a repository um, or even reuse portions in a subsequent work. Um, so that is why it's really important to make sure you're reading those agreements and um, retaining the rights that you think you're going to need in your work in the future. Um, so transferring copyright also doesn't have to be all or nothing. The law um, allows you to transfer some rights while you hold back some rights for yourself and others. Okay, so we can go on to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the most important thing um, I can tell you in trying to retain more of those author rights is don't just automatically sign your author agreement as it's presented to you. Um, read it first and remember that publishers are often willing to negotiate with you on at least some points in that agreement. Um, another piece of advice is to consult an author addendum. So these are pre-created addenda that you can either add to your agreement in full or you can use them as a jumping off point um, to think of ideas for changes that you want to advocate for. Um, and a really good example of an author addendum is provided by Spark, um, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. And it's linked there in the slide. Um, you can also alter your author agreement just by crossing out clauses you don't like um, and suggesting alternatives that better meet your need. Um, and the worst they can do is say no. So it's always worth, worth it to read and read your agreement and ask um, for what you need. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, so some um, of the rights you might want to ask for um, in this negotiation process, um, the right to use your work in your classes, um, the right to post your work on your own websites or archive it in an institutional repository. Um, also to post earlier versions of your work, for example, pre-peer review or a preprint or a postprint um, in an institutional repository. So those are things you can ask for. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Um, other types of clauses you really want to look out for because um, they can really affect your rights. Um, one would be the governing law and jurisdiction section. So paying attention to any clauses that dictate which states or countries in some cases laws apply to the agreement um, and where any lawsuits would take place. So you don't wanna, for example, end up in the Netherlands in an arbitration if you can help it if there's a dispute. Um, so another, another thing to look for is indemnification, warranties and arbitration clauses. So these types of clauses can create liability for you as the author and also limit your options in the event there's a conflict. Confidentiality clauses. Um, so these clauses would require you not to disclose some or all of the terms of the agreement. Um, so whether that's something you wanna to ask to remove or just something you wanna be aware of, um, look for that. Um, also really importantly, uh, clauses that have to do with reuse and reproducibility. Um, so these are the types of clauses that govern what you and others can do with your work in the future. So does the agreement make your work open access? That would be great. Um, does it allow you to archive a copy in the institutional repository um, or a disciplinary repository? Um, does it attach a Creative Commons license to your work, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, so all of those options can increase your readership and your citation accounts. Okay, we can go on to the next. Okay, so this is a big block of text that I don't expect everyone to read in detail, but this is just an example of a fairly typical clause in a publication agreement. Um, so just generally speaking, you can see that it has the author permanently granting all of their rights to the pu publisher, rights to reproduce and publish, et cetera. Um, in all of these different formats, including formats we haven't even invented yet. Um, so it's a pretty restrictive type of clause. Um, so how might we make this better? 
Um, we can go on to the next slide. So this is just one really easy thing you could do in this sort of situation. Um, so you would change that grants and assigns language um, to a license for a limited number of years. So this would give the publisher the exclusive right to make money off the work for that period of time and then it reverts back to you. Um, you could also have the license become non-exclusive after that initial period of exclusivity. Um, then if you, if you do retain the exclusive grant language, you might also ask for them to license some rights back to you. So maybe the right to use your work in your classes, post the work on your website, archive it in an institutional repository, maybe post earlier versions of the work. So those are all ways you can make this sort of clause better or at least ask to. Um, and then another idea of course is to attach that spark author addendum or ask for specific changes from that addendum. Um, so that addendum, um, I, won't link, I won't open it now, but um, basically it says that notwithstanding any terms in the publication agreement, you as the author retain the right to reproduce and distribute and display the work for non-commercial purposes. It also allows you to make derivative works, authorize others to make non-commercial uses of the work. Um, and it also allows you as the author to comply with any requirements of the entity that might have funded the work. So for example, if an agency of the US government funded the research and requires that that be made available for free online. So those are just some ideas of things to ask for when you're negotiating with the publisher. Okay. Um, and then if the publisher says no, which is always a possibility, um, and you find that that agreement is unacceptable to you, or if you just wanna be looking from the outset at more open alternatives, you can consider publishing that article in an open access journal. Um, so there are lots of reputable open access journals that you can find in this directory of open access journals. Um, and the journal's archiving policies can be found in the Sherpa Romeo database, which is linked there too. Um, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association also has um, very strict stand standards for membership, so you can find a reputable open access journal there. Um, and so, yeah, these journals use open licenses to make your article available for free to users. Um, they often use Creative Commons licenses, um, and those are standardized licenses that offer varying degrees of openness. Um, so the most permissive of those licenses only requires attribution to the original. And then the other Creative Commons licenses add more restrictions and protections. Um, for example, like saying users can't make derivative works or that a new work that uses your work has to be shared in the same way as the original. Um, so that is an overview of author rights and licensing. Um, and I'll also just say that as you're looking over your author agreements um, and negotiating, I'm always available to read those agreements for you and help suggest um, places where you might ask for changes um, and also just help you understand what you're agreeing to. So please get in touch with me if I can be helpful. All right, great. Thank you, Kate. Um, so say you decide that you do want to publish in an open art, open access journal. Um, usually in most cases, um, if you're going to publish in an open access journal, um, you are going to be asked to pay an article processing charge. And what an article processing charge is 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 it basically covers the publishing costs um, uh, that a subscription fee that we that the library or individuals pay um, uh, in order to be able to publish uh, that journal and the articles in that journal. So instead of um, necessarily the library paying, the author would pay. Um, and those and these article processing charges can range from three hundred dollars to five thousand dollars, depending on um, uh, what the journal charges. Um, and then uh, APCs can be charged on fully open access journals, or they can be charged on um, journals that are, have both paid content, so paywall, um, paywalled content and open access content. And the journals that have both are called hybrid journals. Um, so when you're thinking about publishing your article um, and you want to um, 
publish in open access, you really need to consider at the very beginning how you might pay for the, that APC charge. So um, APCs can be funded as part of uh, uh, research grants. Um, and um, so you can write them into your grant. Uh, one of the places that you can look to find if that's something that the uh, granting um, agency would be willing to fund is the Sherpa Juliet uh, database that's um, uh, connected to the Sherpa Romeo database. And I'm going to um, escape just real quick and show you kind of what that looks like. So if you were to go to this website and wanted to see what a particular funder's um, archiving requirements are and things like that, what Kate talked about. You can also see what the other requirements are. And so you can browse or search. And um, when you find the one you're gonna do, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose the MacArthur Foundation. They encourage open access archiving. They encourage open access publishing. They encourage data archiving. And so when you click on that particular um, foundation, you can see that in, under the encourages open access publishing, um, cost of open access publishing should be included in funding applications. So um, you wanna check and see here if that's something that um, they are um, interested in seeing in your, fund, in your application and funding. Now, even if it doesn't say that though, I would still um, uh, check with their uh, the requirements of the grant to see if they're if you can at least include it even if it doesn't necessarily get funded because I think it's important to at least try and 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 you know talk about why you would support why you would want to publish open access because also there are a lot of funders that require that you at some point make your work available openly whether there's like a 12 month embargo or um, a requirement that you um, publish in an open access journal or something like that, that is that is often part of, a, of the grant. So that's something to look at as well. And then we also have a page on our website um, that I'll go to at the end of this uh, presentation that includes some um, funding agency, government funding agencies that you can look at as well. Um, Another option that you could explore uh, is our, the library has an uh, open access publishing fund. Um, this publishing fund is limited. We only um, budget uh, $15,000 a year for it because it comes directly out of the collections budget. And um, we um, will award a author up to $1,000 one time per fiscal year uh, to uh, help cover the cost of um, uh, an article processing charge. There is some eligibility requirements that has to be peer reviewed. It has to meet the journal evaluation criteria, which is usually related to kind of some of the things that Kate talked about in terms of being part of um, the OP, oh, I can't remember the, the acronym, but part of uh, open access um, organizations, uh, directory of open access journals, things like that. Um, it, we the library does not fund hybrid journals because that would basically mean we would be paying twice um, a subscription and the APC and um, we, we, are, we can't support that. Um, we need to be able to see what the fee schedule is so we know that it's they're not just deciding on the fly how much they're going to charge a particular author. author. Um, like I said, we will only um, uh, fund one article per faculty member per year. And um, you, it's best if you can exhaust all options prior to coming to the library, um, including department funding. And as you could see from the how much it actually costs, $1,000 is oftentimes not gonna cover it. So you're need, you're, you would need to find other funding sources. And my experience, oftentimes departments will also, will fund the um, remainder of the balance. Um, uh, and again, you can review all of the um, uh, requirements on the uh, on our website. Um, I will say that this fund tends to be depleted by the end of the first semester of the fiscal year. So, um, you know, timing wise, that is when you'd want to try to apply. Um, the other thing too is because it comes out of the collections budget, and the collections budget um, is uh, isn't always in a great place we there are there might be a year that we might not be able to fund any at all so I also wouldn't necessarily at the very beginning of your process um, uh, expect to get funding from the library we 
absolutely want to try to support it as much as we can, but we can't be the first place that uh, funding is identified. The other thing that the library does try to do in terms of trying to support faculty in open access, open access publishing is to work with the publishers that we contract with for um, our journal subscriptions to see if we can get some discounts or deals related to um, uh, open access publishing. So for example, with Sage Publishing, we have a journal package with them and they with that journal package provide a 10% discount. Another new one that we are excited about is Cambridge University Press. Um, we'll cover all of the cost of your APC that it, which is part of our um, journal package. This is these are called read and publish deals. Um, we try to participate in these as much as we can, as long as it's financially feasible. Sometimes they ask you to pay significant more money. And unfortunately, we are not usually able to do that. But for something like Sage and Cambridge, they just wrapped it into our already uh, our, our um, uh, costs as they were set already. But um, as new deals and discounts come available, they will be posted on our website. Um, so you can go back and check and see um, okay, I'm going to publish with this journal. Does the library have any deals related to that? Okay, so that is uh, everything related to funding um, that I have. If you have, like Kate said, if you have any questions about author rights or licensing, definitely contact her. And then if you have any questions about funding, you can contact me. I also um, would link out to, we have a several pages related to publishing on our website. Um, uh, and then if you want to, um, there's a grants and funding page. And um, on that page, like I said, there's the funding agencies that we listed, um, information about um, the open access publishing fund, and the link to the form, and then the deals that we have currently. Um, I don't know what that is. I didn't want to open anything. Hey, Liz, um, I had a couple questions that came through in the chat. I think one was if y'all could possibly drop the links that you're sharing um, into the chat so that other people can go and visit those pages, they would like to be able to do that. And I think um, earlier in the session, when Kate was presenting, um, uh, Tiantia, there was a link that you wanted. Can can you clarify for me which link you wanted and we'll make sure we get that in the chat as well. Um, and then there's a question. Um, is there a possibility that some faculty members will not have the $1,000 grant year based on depletion of funds? Yes, yeah, so if we don't, if our budget for this has been depleted, then we, we are unable to grant funds towards the APC. Um, and once that does happen, there will be a note at the top of um, the this the page here um, that will say um, in big red letters that the funding has been depleted and it's not available again until the next fiscal year. Okay, thank you. What other questions do we have? We have such a small group. I feel like that you could just unmute and ask your questions if you want to, or you can drop them in the chat, which I'm watching. I'm curious, um, and I don't want to go in front of anybody, so if anybody else has something, um, but I'm just curious. It's so you've got about $15,000, you said, and you allot them at $1,000. So there are at least 15 different authors who take advantage of this. Do you seem to have a lot more demand behind that um, than what's there? Like, I'm trying to get an estimate of how many faculty are trying to publish open access on average. Well, it's hard to say. We've tried to do some um surveying of departments to see because not sure. a lot of the funding's not coming from us it's coming from departments right. or grants or their pockets sometimes it just depends on what it you know who's publishing um i a couple years ago the grant was ten thousand dollars and i upped it to 15 because we were getting so many requests um we do we do get more requests than we have funding for but like i said it does come out of the collections budget and the collections budget is not in a place to um increase that 
fund at this point. Um, uh, mostly, uh, partly because the cost of library materials go up five percent at least every year, and then also maybe, other budgeting reasons. So yeah, maybe let me back up too because I, I I think it's great that you're funding these costs at all. I think what I was trying to find out was the demand, right? It, how many how many requests do you get? Like I guess it stops at when the funding's out that you don't continue getting requests. But I guess what I'm trying to find out is about how many open access papers are published each year that might have funding attached to them. Not specifically from you, but that's, I don't know if you can even speak to that, but it would we, be interesting to me. We tried, I mean, Kate, and you might want to talk about this. We, like I said, we sent a survey out to all of the um, units to find out, you know, if they've been funding open access charges and things like that. Um, we didn't necessarily hear back from everyone. We do try to get that information. It's just very hard because if you're funding sure. it yourself and you're not really telling anybody, we, it's right. hard to record that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great. I was just curious if the numbers were. And it looks like Tianka had a, a question about the links in the PowerPoint. I think if it's possible, is this PowerPoint shareable? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Absolutely. wonderful. If you email it to me after the session is over, I will send this out to everyone who was present today. Does that, I think that will answer a lot of people's questions about the links since they're in the presentation. Yeah, Thank and you. I just shared the author addendum link um, just so you have that, but um, all of the links are in the presentation once that's sent up to you. Yeah, and I can um, send this link as well. Oh, that's not the link I meant to send, sorry. So can I ask a question as well while you're doing that? So Alicia and I are working on a grant and the grant requirements um, say that we would provide the final products for the grant on both open educational resources and licensed through an open access licensing authority. So if we were to get a website um, that we could, that we would include in the grant. So we would pay for the website domain and make everything open access. Would that technically cover what they're talking about is both educational, open educational resources and licensed through an open access licensing authority? Uh, yeah, I would be interested to see that. Um, and would, I'd be happy to look at that too, but without looking at it, um, I, my guess is that they want a Creative Commons license or something akin to that attached. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to help look at that. Um, okay, I can, I, Kate, I can, I can, I'll send you the, like the RFP piece and I'll tell you where things are so you can kind of have a read through what they're looking for. Basically, okay. I, I think it's part of the grant that they want us to develop these, this system, this package, and they want to make sure that we are giving the package away that we are, it's, it's, a, it's for the Office of Special Education Programs. And uh -huh. I have a feeling they do not want us to like keep or try and sell these kind of things after the the grant is finished. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. And and I imagine that the website you're envisioning probably does um, fulfill that requirement. But um, I again, I'd be happy to look at it. Great. Also Thank wondering you. too if you didn't want to build a whole website but you wanted to put the product somewhere, you could put it in our institutional repository. Um, that's a great point um you know one of the things that we were going to try to do is um, provide a place for um, open educational resources to live that are created on our campus so that's a possibility as well and and that would be free right correct yeah. everything ah. in the institutional repository is free johnny okay. doesn't the rfp say something about o oer yes that's yeah, on there the, the open educational resources yeah, that's a site, right? Open educational resources can be any educational resources that is openly available. So it could be hosted anywhere. Oh, okay, so you just advertise on there or they would put it on there and it would link to our page? Yeah, I mean, it could go, you could, you could link to your page. You could create your own page there. You could, I mean, there are lots of different ways to do it. It just, the main thing is it's just open. that you, It's on the open web. Anyone could access it. Anyone can use it. And of course, if there's, um. A creative commons license on it there are other options too like and kate can talk about this in terms of like how it can be used um in terms of you know replication and things like that yeah um 
I, th I think you referred to a licensing authority and I'm not sure yes. besides co Creative Commons what that specifically would mean, but um, yeah, I think that having it in the institutional repository with a Creative Commons license should, should meet those requirements. <laughs> Okay, well, Kate, look for something out. I'll send it to you here in just a minute, okay? Thanks. Okay, sounds good. Thanks a lot. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Liz and Kate, for giving us this presentation today. Um, I will share out um, the PowerPoint after you email that to me to everyone who's in attendance today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm looking in the chat now. Lots of people are saying thank you to both of you. We appreciate your expertise on this topic. Thanks, course, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Don't be afraid to reach out. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah.